Welcome. My name is Hawk Jones, and I'll be the moderator for this Engineers Without Borders webinar, Travel Medicine for Engineers Without Borders USA. This presentation is one of the core programs in the expanding series of online, on-demand, continuing education programs created by Engineers Without Borders USA and presented by Contract Solutions Group. Before I turn the program over to our presenter, I'd like to make a couple of announcements regarding the program. As our program begins, you'll notice the program itself will fill the majority of your computer screen. On the lower left of your screen, you'll see a pause play button. If for any reason you need to pause the presentation, click once on the pause button. To restart the program, simply click on the play arrow that will appear in the same place. If you should need technical assistance, please click on the email link for client services at Contract Solutions Group located on our website pages, or you may call us for assistance. If you're disconnected from the webinar due to local internet issues, simply log back in through the Engineers Without Borders website and restart the program. After the program, you'll be taken directly to an attendance reporting page. It is very important that you complete the short form and submit it immediately upon completion of the program to receive full credit for your participation in this program. If this step is bypassed, neither you nor your chapter will receive credit. This presentation was developed for the 2010 EWB USA Regional Workshops by Allison Clough, MD, MPH, and member of the EWB Health and Safety Committee. Allison is a family physician and medical anthropologist who has practiced and studied travel medicine, security, and international health for over 20 years. Her work has taken her to Papua New Guinea, Nicaragua, and Ecuador, where she was the physician of record for the release of pipeline workers who'd been held hostage in the jungle. Since joining EWB USA at Northern Arizona University, she has volunteered her expertise for her chapter and the national organization. To underscore the importance of the health and safety of all EWB USA members and partners, Catherine A. Leslie, PE and Executive Director of EWB USA, will be giving this presentation. Ms. Leslie has been traveling internationally on engineering projects for over 20 years and has been the Executive Director of EWB USA as a volunteer since 2002 and as a full-time employee since 2008. She brings first-hand experience to the health and safety issues faced by EWB USA traveling teams. Kathy, I'll turn the program over to you. Hello, I am Kathy Leslie, the Executive Director of Engineers Without Borders USA. The health and safety of our volunteer members is of utmost concern, and that is why we have chosen to focus this webinar on travel medicine for our traveling members. Over the next hour, we will talk about the Health and Safety Plan, or HASP, and how it helps you plan a safe and successful project. And we will discuss four important travel health and safety topics in detail, diarrhea, vaccines, malaria, and security. Please note that this is not a comprehensive review of travel medicine. While EWB USA requires teams to include health and safety officers who have taken CPR and first aid, it is important to recognize that many of our project sites are hours or days from competent medical care or rescue by even the best evacuation companies. We highly recommend that every team has at least two members with the advanced skills of a wilderness first responder, other international health course, and first aid or a higher level of training. This talk is also not a substitute for seeing your travel medicine specialist prior to going in country. But let's start with some statistics. Every year, 80 million people travel from developed countries like the U.S. to less developed countries. For every 100,000 travelers per month, 50,000 get sick, 8,000 see a physician, and one dies. This adds up to 500 to 1,000 deaths annually amongst travelers. Most of the deaths are from diseases travelers bring with them, such as heart disease, diabetes, and lung disease in particular. However, a quarter of the deaths are from trauma, overwhelmingly from motor vehicle accidents, and about 4% of travel-related deaths are from infectious disease. Most deaths from trauma and infectious disease can be prevented. The HASP guides you through the planning to minimize risks. The first three sections of the HASP are the most important documents you will need in a medical emergency, the emergency contact page, the team health checklist, and maps to medical facilities. Each member of the team must complete the personal health checklist and make several copies. The trip leader should read all these forms and put them in sealed envelopes in the first aid kit. 
It's also a good idea for each traveler to keep a copy of the personal health checklist on his or her person and for the trip coordinator to have copies in sealed envelopes at home. Team members with unusual health conditions or with conditions that might get worse with the stress of travel should provide instructions for managing their care if they become sick or injured. Nearly half of the travelers get diarrhea. But avoiding local food is not the answer. Food is the currency of hospitality, of business, and it is an art form of which people are deeply proud. But the HASP reminds us that food is also a biological hazard. Avoiding this hazard is a matter of knowing what is safe to eat wherever it is made. Dr. Allison Kluss is a member of EWB USA and a medical doctor. Her five-finger rules are a great guideline for letting you know how to enjoy food without getting diarrhea. Drink boiled water. The water doesn't actually need to boil. If the temperature is raised to 160 degrees Fahrenheit for half an hour, it's safe. But boiling doesn't include the, improve the taste or appearance or remove dangerous chemicals and heavy metals. It is also expensive and environmentally damaging in some parts of the world. Good water filtration systems can remove chemicals and other impurities as well as infectious causes of diarrhea. They are environmentally friendly. You can carry a personal or expedition backpacking filter wherever you travel. But just be aware, there's a lot of bad filters, filters on the market. Do your research and choose one with a 0.2 micron pore size, a halogen resin, and charcoal filtration for the best results. These filters are environmentally friendly and easy to use. There are also many effective water treatments, and we can't list them all here. Do your research, focusing especially on their efficacy against parasites as well as against bacteria and viruses, whether they work in cloudy water and whether they require a very long time to work in extremely cold water. Ultraviolet treatment is fast and appealing to those gadget geeks in EWB USA, but it only purifies a small amount of water at a time. None of those treatment methods includes improves the palatability of nasty water or removes the chemicals and heavy metals. Yes, go ahead and drink commercially bottled beverages. Always reject any bottle that has been open or that appears to have been tampered with. A popular ploy is to drug beer and wine. Another is to refill water bottles. But plastic water bottles re represent a huge environmental problem around the world, and it should not be anybody's primary means of securing drinking water. So think about it. The second rule is to not eat food that has been touched by the human hand just before serving. While the bread and the meat and the sandwich are each quite safe, if the person who puts it together was not wearing clean gloves or have clean hands, you could wind up with diarrhea. So only eat fingered foods where you can see them being made safely or when you can make it yourself. The third rule is that cooked hot food is safe to eat. Here the enchiladas were assembled by human hands, but they were then heated through an oven before serving. The hot rice and beans are also safe to eat, as long as they have been kept warm, which means over 140 degrees Fahrenheit. But watch out for the uncooked garnishes, like the green vegetables and the unmelted cheese. If there is sour cream, you need to be assured that it's from pasteurized milk. Cooked meat and dairy products are safe to eat. An exception to this is seafood poison. Generally, if you eat the fish products that the locals eat, you will be protected from these dangerous poisons. Don't let a fisherman sell you anything that the local people are refusing. The fourth rule is to eat raw fruits and vegetables you wash and peel yourself. The insides are safe, and in remote rural areas where they come right from the farm to your table, they're delicious. Beware of lettuce. Soaking it in bleach would not remove all the sand from wrinkly lettuce. Neither will it remove all the parasites, virus, and bacteria. And lastly, the fifth rule is to know whether cold foods have been refrigerated right after they are made and kept in the fridge until served, or if they've been left on the counter while the restaurant chilled the more profitable beer. As a side note, rice that is often cooked and left out overnight can be a wonderful cause of diarrhea. So either reheat the cooked rice or refrigerate it immediately. Don't take antibiotics to prevent tablet traveler's diarrhea. They damage the normal intestinal flora, which is part of your body's mechanism of resistance. You can take Pepto-Bismol four times a day for a couple of days, starting right before an unavoidable exposure and during the exposure. You can also take probiotics as capsules, pills, or live yogurt. However, there are times when antibiotics for diarrhea can save your trip. 
Your travel doctor should provide you with a prescription and recommendations for when to take those antibiotics. The most important thing to do if you get diarrhea and vomiting is to drink. If you can eat more than a few bites of food, water is fine, but if you are nauseated and vomiting, you must replace electrolytes too. UNICEF oral rehydration solution can be purchased around the world for pennies. Traditional electrolyte replacements like chicken soup, Gatorade, or Atoli work just fine. If you have room in your luggage, a large container of Gatorade powder is worth the wait. Most people will drink it. You can make your own oral rehydration solution with eight teaspoons of sugar and one teaspoon of salt per liter of water. You can flavor this with any non-caloric flavor such as artificially sweetened Kool-Aid. The challenge is to get a sick patient to drink enough, which is a couple of liters every day and more if there's a fever, plus half a liter for each loose stool. Here are some over-the-counter medicines your first aid kit should contain. An anti-nausea drug such as Dramamine, don't overdose it because it can cause hallucinations. Tagamet or Zantac, medicines for acid stomach, also help nausea. Pepto-Bismol soothes the stomach and it shortens the illness. People who have been advised not to take aspirin should not take Pepto-Bismol. Traditional remedies are often very helpful, chamomile, ginger, lime, and licorice. But beware, peppermint, caffeine, alcohol, and chocolate can all make vomiting worse. Severe diarrhea with fever, with blood in the stool, or causing severe dehydration can be life-threatening. It is one of the conditions for which you must activate your emergency plan. If your patient is not getting better and shows sign of worsening dehydration, they need to get to a qualified health care for IV treatment. A good travel medicine clinic will recommend which immunizations you need. You can also go online to the cdc.gov website Click on the destination country and learn about immunizations, malaria, and other health and security issues. And to determine what immunizations you've had, your best source are your parents and your own doctor. Many adults in the United States have never been immunized and have never gotten the routine childhood illnesses. These diseases are now rare in the developed countries because of immunizations, but if unimmunized adults travel to less developed countries, they may get measles, mumps, diphtheria, polio, or whooping cough. These diseases are far more dangerous in adults when, than they are in children. So please, if you've never been fully immunized, get all these vaccines before you travel. Polio is still crippling and killing in nearly 30 countries around the world. Efforts to eradicate the disease are impeded by war, political unrest, and natural disasters. If you are traveling into a polio zone, get a booster if you were previously immunized. The 1918 pandemic killed 10% of all Americans, beginning with young workers and their physicians. Flu is still the leading cause of vaccine-preventable death in the United States, so get the flu shot. Hepatitis A is a routine childhood illness in developing countries. Children who get hepatitis A are hardly, hardly sick at all. However, adults who get hepatitis A are sick for months and may even die. In many parts of the U.S., hepatitis A is a routine childhood immunization to prevent adults from catching the disease. All travelers to developing countries should be immunized against hepatitis A. Although you can and must prevent most diarrheal disease with good hygiene, Typhoid fever is such a serious illness that the vaccine is highly recommended if you go off the beaten track in less developed countries. There are only two immunizations that may be required for you to travel, yellow fever and bacterial meningitis. In the United States, many young people are immunized against bacterial meningitis when they start college or join the military. Travelers to sub-Saharan Africa are at risk for this disease, and those who travel to Mecca must have proof of this immunization as disease outbreaks are frequent and rapidly deadly. Hepatitis B is different from hepatitis A. It is transmitted the same way AIDS is, which is through exposure to bodily fluids, but is far more contagious than HIV. Infection with this virus can kill you rapidly, or it can become chronic and cause cirrhosis or liver cancer. In parts of Asia, 30% of the population is infected. To prevent an epidemic in the U.S., most infants are immunized at birth. Adults living for more than a month in areas with high rates of hepatitis B or who will be exposed to body and blood fluids need the immunization. 
three doses, take six months, but last a lifetime. There are two less common vaccines that some travelers need to consider. Japanese encephalitis is transmitted by mosquitoes in humid parts of Asia. Infection causes inflammation of the brain and often leaves permanent brain damage. If you will be outside of cities in the red areas on this map for a week or more, please consider getting immunized against Japanese encephalitis. Pre-exposure rabies vaccines are expensive, hundreds of dollars. However, it is a good idea to consider if you will be spending more than a month in a high-risk rural area or if you're a caver or if you're biking, bicycling or hiking through remote regions or if you handle animals. If you do not have pre-exposure immunization, you must begin a series of shots within a week of being bitten or getting the saliva of a possibly infected animal on an even very small wound. Even with pre-exposure shots, rabies is a horrible way to die, and it is virtually 100% fatal. In 2004, a woman contracted rabies after handling a sick bat. Intensive care, huge doses of immune globulin, many doses of vaccine, and a large dose of luck saved her life. After learning to walk again, she's now in college. This is an important point for travelers. Your travel insurance company should help you find the immunizations you need abroad. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the world's most deadly animal. It kills at least a million people every year. Mosquitoes carry many deadly diseases, including malaria, Japanese encephalitis, dengue, West Nile virus, and the list goes on. There are four kinds of human malaria. Only falciparum malaria, which is more common in Africa, is usually fatal, and it can kill in a matter of days. Vivax and ovale malaria, which are less common in Africa and more common in all other parts of the world, are far less dangerous. What is most interesting about Vivax and ovale is that they can hide in the liver for years, and you can get malaria for the first time long after you've left the malaria zone. This can be prevented by taking a different anti-malarial medicine after your return from a heavily infected area. The CDC website or your travel doctor can clarify what your malarial risk is where you intend to travel. This map shows the risk of falciparum malaria around the world. There are a number of medications to prevent malaria, each of which is effective in the right location. In general, people who are traveling to areas with a high risk of falciparum malaria should either take doxycycline or malarone. If you are traveling to an area with other forms of malaria, chloroquine followed by primaquine after your return home is an excellent choice. Many travelers to areas with low-risk malaria take nothing to prevent it. They avoid insect bites and carry medications to take if they contract the disease. Again, this is a discussion you should have with your own doctor before traveling. Within 30 minutes of an Infected mosquito bite, malaria parasites invade liver cells where they're protected from most malaria medicine. These parasites multiply until the cells burst, releasing the parasites into the blood where they each invade a red blood cell. In the blood cells, the parasites multiply again until they burst the cells. And so now a huge number of parasites are now in the bloodstream. About a week after the infected bite, as the parasites burst out of your liver, you feel vaguely ill, shaking chills, fevers of 100 degree, 104 degrees or more, and drenching sweats follows as parasites destroy your red blood cells. At first, you may be ill for a day and then have several days before falling ill again. This is the classic cyclic malarial fever. Falciparum malaria can infect the brain and can kill in hours. Cerebral malaria is usually fatal. The rapid destruction of blood and liver cells can cause jaundice. The lower picture compares the skin color of a healthy Caucasian, and on the right, a Caucasian with jaundice. Blackwater fever is kidney failure caused by overwhelming destructions of red blood cells, and it is usually fatal. Can you diagnose malaria in the field? Believe it or not, clinical diagnosis based on these signs and symptoms is more accurate than the diagnoses offered in most rural clinics in the third world. If you suspect malaria, call your travel physician or evacuation insurance provider immediately for advice. Malaria test kits are very accurate in most travelers. Some travel doctors have their clients carry these kits in an emergency treatment for malaria. In areas where there is no falciparum malaria, the patient may then stay in the field. Where there is falciparum malaria, the patient must be evacuated even with treatment. 
Some travel medicine physicians require, recommend that travelers carry test kits for the rapid diagnosis of malaria. With this kit, you can find out if you have malaria and whether or not it is falciparum. You still need a plan and protocol from your travel doctor. The bottom line is that no anti-malarial medication is 100% effective, and bugs carry a lot more diseases than just malaria. From the inside to the outside, the five layers of protection are the innermost layer, which means you're planning immunizations and medications to prevent disease. Next, use a good repellent and check your skin. Sustained release repellent is best, and be sure to check for ticks twice a day. Treat your clothes with permethrin. Create a personal space, usually around your bed, that is safe from bugs. And try to make a space where you can get together with your team that is bug proof. So let's look at these one at a time. Planning and preparation is different depending on your destination and your activity. Take your medicine and get the right immunizations and think about your other layers of protection. There are now four equivalent products to prevent bug bites. Travel docs used to feel only that DEET, the active ingredient in Backwoods Off, was effective enough. But now, Picardin, oil of lemon eucalyptus, not the health store kinds, but the chemicals, also known as PMD, and IR3535 have all been demonstrated to be as effective when properly used. So find a sustained release preparation and put it on the minute you wake up and more often during the day than the label specifies. Test it at home first in case you're allergic, but have zero tolerance for bites. Remember, it only takes one bite to get dangerous, dangerously ill. If you are in tick country and tick season, search your entire body carefully for ticks every 12 hours, including under your underwear. Have a buddy look at your back. If you find any that are already implanted, simply grasp them near the head with tweezers and pull straight out. It is rare for mouth parts to remain unless you've damaged the tick. Do not try to burn, paint, or otherwise torture the tick because that will cause the tick to regurgitate infectious manner into your blood. Just pull it out. A tick must be attached for 12 to 24 hours to transmit disease. Your clothing is the third layer of defense. Wear long pants, not the shorts pictured here. Lightweight cottons and linen are professional looking and comfortable off the job site in the tropics. Treat all your outer clothes with permethrin to prevent bugs from biting through. In tick country, tuck your trouser legs into your permethrin-treated socks and spray your shoe tops with permethrin. If you must wear a skirt, treat it with permethrin and the insects, insects will not want to be inside it with you. Spray permethrin, shown here, lasts about five weeks or five washings. Clothes pre-treated by the manufacturer or clothes you have soaked in permethrin are bug-proof for 50 was washings or one year. Give yourself a personal space. Open mosquito netting is ridiculous. Effective mosquito netting must be continuous and tucked in around the bottom. It is best treated with permethrin. Very lightweight tents of mosquito netting also have floors to keep out the bugs. In the heat and humidity of the tropics, train yourself to sleep in light cotton pajamas or scrubs on top of your sleeping bag or sheet, no matter how hot it is, because it can save your life. A common area where you can eat, cool off, and have your tailgate meetings also allows you to focus on your work. If there is an appropriate room in a building, repair and maintain all the screens and be sure the door does not let in bugs, and then spray the space or use a citronella coil to kill those that get in. Sometimes you may need to create a safe space with a mos mosquito-proof gazebo or giant bed net. As you are completing your house, take a sincere look at the environmental conditions of your project. Too often, travelers don't plan for the liter an hour fluid replacement a body requires during hard physical labor in the heat or to replace electrolytes lost through sweating when they can't take in enough salty food. Even at rest, very hot weather increases your minimum daily requirement from about two liters to five liters per day. High altitude carries specific and sometimes deadly risks, as do the mammals. Hippos are the most dangerous animals in Africa and the snakes, and the insects that are specific to your area. Do your research. It is unlikely you will have access to antivenom. You must prevent contact with dangerous animals. Finally, both your engineering design and your safety plans must not neglect, neglect extreme weather conditions that might in fact impact your project. How do you plan to travel? Remember that about 25% of travel-related deaths are from trauma, and most of these are caused by motor vehicles. 
The safest ways to travel are major airlines, puddle jumpers, and with a hired local driver in his own car. Third world puddle jumpers, including the minor airlines in Africa, are among the most dangerous modes of air travel in the world, which means to say they're about as safe mile for mile as driving in the USA. Overcrowded public transport, a car you can rent, and motorcycles are the least safe ways to get around less developed countries. A good source for further information is our EWB USA Document 609, Travel Safety Procedures, which are in the Sourcebook Downloads, downloads page of the website. The risk of being kidnapped is slightly greater than the risk of dying during travel. Development workers and representatives of multinational corporations are at a slightly higher risk. But despite our best intentions, not all people see globalization, modernization, or development as a good thing. Development often means a loss of traditional values and a reduction in indigenous autonomy. Development workers and representatives of multinationals are seen as potentially rich resources of ransom money. So the HAS asks you to take the time to understand your security risks. EWB USA requires that your HAS contains the safety and security information of your site from two sources, the US Department of State and ISOS. You can also refer to the CIA World Fast Factbook. Look for security insights outside of government information as well. Security celebrity Robert Young Pelton writes thoroughly enjoyable compendiums on the dangers of travel. This simple list of behaviors can save your life. Be alert, be sober, and travel light. Unless your institution requires other coverage, EWB USA requires you to carry Seven Corners insurance to pay for medical emergencies and evacuations, an international SOS for current and accurate security assessment and evacuation. Every member of the travel team must carry the same insurance to minimize expensive and even tragic mistakes. EWB USA also recommends that travelers be sure to have US health insurance for at least six months after their return from the third world. A post-trip physical is not likely to uncover any infections you are harboring if you don't have symptoms. But once you develop those symptoms, diagnosis and treatment can be very expensive. So back to Pelton's advice. There is the matter of trust. It is very important to make friends, but guard your trust. That nice person in the airport who says she is from Kansas may be looking for a place to stash contraband. It's happened. Avoid tourists because they attract pickpockets and other thieves. Dress and behave as if you lived in country in some lower level business position. This is an important part of discretion. Sex tourism is among the most devastating developments of globalization and has resulted in the reemergence of STDs. Use of drugs is illegal in many nations and may land the tourist in jail or worse. Studies in Europe find that college students and professionals, contrary to popular belief, return surprisingly often with stories of rape or robbery and sexually transmitted diseases picked up while traveling and working abroad. Please, please, please don't engage in sex tourism. This is one of the most devastating effects of globalization. Your team is your best security resource. Someone can always be on duty to guard the luggage, but guard the luggage. Don't just sit with it. If you travel alone, check all the big stuff. If you need to use the restroom, Go immediately after getting off the plane. You can hire a skycap and be ready with them to pick up your luggage the moment it arrives in baggage claim. Then you can be the guard. Soft-sided luggage is easy to break into even with a lock. All you need is a pen or pocket knife to separate the zipper. Take out the valuables, put in the contraband and or a bomb, and reseal the bag by moving the locked zippers around. If you travel alone, check all the big stuff. There are a number of well-designed products to protect soft-sided luggage. The steel mesh bag can also be used in your hotel room to turn your backpack into a safe. You can also purchase backpacks and soft side luggage reinforced with steel mesh on the inside to prevent slash thieves. You are under surveillance by pickpockets, thieves, prostitutes, black marketeers, and kidnappers in every public place. These criminals work in team. Often one is a helpless woman, a crazy mother who throws her baby at you, or an apparently retarded person. The partner robs you while you are distracted. These are good examples of why to use a decoy purse or wallet containing mock credit cards and ID, and just a few dollars that you can conveniently spend on food or inexpensive souvenirs. Hide your passport, make copies to keep in your first aid kit or other luggage, and keep a copy at home. 
money and important medications, not just in your money belt, but built in pockets sewn into your underwear, inside shirt or jacket pockets, under an ace wrap around your leg or in your shoe. Don't carry large amounts of money. You can find a Western Union or other money transfer service in some small town near your work site. When you are there, have the trip coordinator at home wire you just enough money for each step of the job. Have your contractors with you when you receive the money and immediately and very privately divide it up into small quantities. Remember, criminals watch Western Union to see who is probably coming out with cash. Be careful. The FTC has a useful website listing all the current money wiring schemes. Your hotel room is where you will finally sleep. However, before you do, take the time to check the locks and make sure no one can come in the windows. This tool from Master Lock fits in a 28-inch suitcase compartment and can be used under doorknobs and in sliding doors and windows to dissuade uninvited entry. Put your valuables in the hotel safe or in a room safe with a combination you set up yourself. Some travelers carry a bike lock to lock their valuable locked luggage to the furniture or plumbing. You are ultimately the only one responsible for yourself and your equipment. Quaint and charming is all well and good, but don't stay in a fire trap. Look for your exits and plan what you do in case of fire before you go to sleep. And find a new home the next day if you need to. The HASP and a comprehensive emergency plan will save your bacon when you're afraid or when you're anxious about a patient. Be sure the first three sections of the HASP are completed, the emergency contact page, the health checklist, and the map to the emer local emergency facilities. Before you need them, know what services the local emergency facility can provide. Some of them are not only inadequate, but they may be dangerous. Research road safety and quality and know what vehicles are available for transport and where you would meet a helicopter or fixed wing aircraft for emergency evacuation. The HASP guides you through the planning to minimize risks. It also requires incident reporting. We need these incident reports in order to improve the safety for our project teams. For medical issues, report any incident that goes beyond a Band-Aid or an, or an over-the-counter drug. Examples of reportable incidents would include broken bones, any wound requiring stitches, severe dehydration, diarrhea, and use of epinephrine or antibiotics. This whirlwind tour of travel medicine gives you some important tools to stay safe and to keep healthy during your EWB project, but it is not enough. Even with the best plans and the best evacuation insurance, you may be hours to days from competent medical care. At a bare minimum, you are required to have at least two members of your team have first aid with CPR. The Health and Safety Committee recommends that at least two members of your party have advanced first aid training through wilderness first responder courses Dr. Kluss International Tra Traveler's Health and First Aid, or some higher certification. And that is the end of the Travel Medicine webinar for our traveling members. Please remember to be safe out there. If you have any questions or would like additional information, please contact us at projects at ewb-usa.org. And now I'd like to turn this back to the moderator. Thank you very much, Kathy, and thank you to our participants for your attention. I'd like to take this opportunity to once again remind our participants that you must complete and submit your attendance on the following web page to receive credit for attending this program. This concludes today's program, Travel Medicine for Engineers Without Borders USA, brought to you by Engineers Without Borders USA and Contract Solutions Group. Please check our online catalog for the latest instructional programming from EWB USA and Contract Solutions Group. This program is copyright 2011 by EWB USA, all rights reserved. Thank you for joining us for this program, and enjoy the rest of your day.